Now we're gonna move on to LIFO and other inventory issues. So ide uh, identify some special issues related to LIFO. So LIFO causes a bunch of kind of special issues. As I mentioned uh, before, when you have LIFO, the inventory sitting on your books at any point in time could be very, very stale costs. So if you're a 50 year old company, as I mentioned, you could have inventory costs that are sitting from 50 years ago because you haven't sold your inventory down to zero, which is incredibly rare and doesn't really ever happen, especially if you're a growing company. So you could have very stale costs. Well, that causes some problems. One from a, the value of the, <laughs> inventory item on the balance sheet itself, which accounting generally has ignored that with the notion that, well, most industries use the same method, so at least it's comparable. Uh, but it also causes some problems if, for instance, you sell off into those layers and you start selling off a lot of your inventory, uh, you could be end up costing very low value items. So um, it also, LIFO is also incredibly difficult to implement on an ongoing basis. So most companies, what they end up doing is they use LIFO for financial reporting purposes, but on an ongoing basis, when they're doing their internal reporting, oftentimes when they're reporting their, when they're doing their taxes, they use either um, FIFO or average costing on a routine basis. I, I said they use FIFO for taxes, which they actually usually use LIFO for taxes because it uh, typically in a rising price environment brings the cost of goods sold um, it raises the cost of goods sold, which gives them a lower profit uh, and they would have to pay lower taxes. That is again, assuming a rising price environment. Okay. So, so because most companies use typically FIFO or, um, weight average costing for their internal tracking purposes. And then at the end of the period, what they do is they, they do some calculations to calculate what it would be under LIFO. And then that's what they use for their financial reporting purposes. So there's a different internal system than there is for external financial reporting. So the difference between those, the difference between say their internal systems using FIFO and their outside financial reporting system using LIFO, the difference between those two amounts is called a LIFO reserve. Now that LIFO reserve generally is capturing, well, uh, the, the typically the mark up necessary to take inventory from LIFO to FIFO, for instance, and that provides investors the information they need to value the inventory correctly on the financial statements. Because as we said, that value of inventory on the financial statements could be very different than what it's actually worth or what it would cost to buy today. So that's called a LIFO reserve. It's the difference between, uh, say, the FIFO or average cost, whatever the internal records are used for tracking purposes and the financial reporting, which is uh, LIFO. It's the LIFO reserve is the difference between these, those two amounts. So let's take an example. Uh, illustrate. So Acme Boot Company uses FIFO method for internal reporting purposes and LIFO for external purposes. At January 1st of 2017, the allowance to reduce inventory to LIFO is $20,000. So that is, that's essentially, that's your LIFO reserve. It, it brings the inventory value down in this case by $20,000 at the beginning of the year. At December 31st, the balance should be $50,000. As a result, Acme Boot realizes a LIFO effect and makes the following entry at year end. So here's our journal entry to reduce inventory to LIFO at the end of the year. Remember, last year that entry was essentially $20,000. This year it's $50,000. The difference there is $30,000. That difference goes into costs of goods sold. So we are going to debit costs of goods sold for $30,000. Again, it's increasing our costs and decreasing the amount we report as inventory. And it's increasing our allowance to reduce inventory to LIFO. That's our LIFO reserve of $30,000. This amount has to be disclosed on the financial statements. Typically in the notes of the financial statements where the company talks about its inventory method, they will disclose what their LIFO reserve is and usually what their inventory is at FIFO or at average costing, whichever one they use. Okay. Assuming that costs are increasing, what effect does LIFO have on, say, our current ratio or our inventory turnover ratio? Again, remember, under LIFO, the actual inventory is going to be lower or generally stated at a very old cost, assuming costs are increasing, which is an assumption we're going to make here. So that is uh, what effect is it going to have on, say, our current ratio that includes current assets, which are now going to be lower, or inventory turnover, which our inventory itself is going to be 
lower in general under LIFO when costs are increasing. Also, does LIFO or FIFO do a better job of matching costs of goods sold to revenue? So there's a lot out there when you start reading and the textbook does the exact same thing. It kind of casts LIFO as this like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. We shouldn't be doing LIFO, but some people still insist on doing it. And it does all these bad things. Well, there is a reason why we have LIFO and why we still have LIFO. And it does a great job of what it's trying to do, um, which is you could easily argue that LIFO actually does a better job of matching the costs to the revenues. So illustration for that. So let's assume we have a company, Pass Inc. It has 1,000 calculators with a cost of $100,000 in inventory at the beginning of the year. 1,000 calculators, $100,000. So during the year, Pass purchases another 1,000 calculators for a total cost of $150,000. And it sells 1,000 calculators, leaving 1,000 calculators in inventory at the end of the year. So under LIFO, the 1,000 calculators at the end of the year will have a value the same as they did at the beginning of the year because it's that's what's sitting in inventory of $100,000. Now, and under FIFO, those same calc those same calculators at the end of the year will have a value sitting in inventory of $150,000. That's the big difference between LIFO and FIFO here. Now, this illustration has been intentionally designed such that what we want to look at is actually what amount goes into costs of goods sold. So, under LIFO, the, what goes into cost of goods sold is the cost of the calculators this year. Note, those are the costs of the calculators this year, the same year we sold the calculators. So if you were to say, well, if, if I bought calculators and sold calculators in the same year, shouldn't I match those costs together? There's a good reason why you might want to do that is under the old method, the question is, well, Maybe the company is just making money because they happen to have way more inventory than they actually should have at the, at the beginning of the year because they did a lousy job of managing inventory last year. They ended up with a bunch of inventory and they got lucky. Prices went way up and they sold a bunch of cheap inventory that gave them a big profit this year. Well, that's great for the company. They got lucky. Their bad management paid off in this case. However, from an investor standpoint, you, you probably don't want to give them too much credit for that. So, under the LIFO method, you are actually matching what the inventory cost this year to what it was sold for this year. Under FIFO, and this illustration shows it, under FIFO, the cost this year is actually what inventory, what inventory cost, the cost of goods sold this year is what that inventory cost you last year to buy. So you're recording revenues for this on based on this year's prices, you're recording costs based on last year's prices. So there's a mismatch under FIFO of the revenue and the costs, whereas LIFO matches those up really tightly. So there is a benefit to LIFO in terms of matching costs to, rev to revenues. Now, it comes at, <laughs> at a cost to the comp to financial reporting quality of your inventory value that's reported is stale and not as meaningful because that value is not current. So it's kind of a balance sheet income statement trade-off. By choosing LIFO, you're probably favoring uh, the income statement. On choosing FIFO, you're favoring a balance sheet presentation. So which one is right? It's hard to say, but they both have their pluses and minuses. And that's what I want you to know. You're giving something up regardless of which one you take. It's not like just choosing uh, FIFO is always the better option and you should never choose LIFO. There's a time when you wanna choose LIFO. So this brings us into our next issue that I kinda of highlighted a little bit when I started this, which is LIFO liquidation. Again, we have these really stale values sitting on our balance sheet and sitting in inventory. Now, that's not a big deal from a income statement standpoint on a go forward basis, unless we sell that inventory. If we sell that inventory, it's what's referred to as LIFO liquidation, where older low cost inventory is sold, resulting in a lower cost of goods sold and higher net income and higher taxes for that period of time. And that's because again, you're liquidating old LIFO layers. So this approach is particularly problematic if we do a specific goods approach where we're tracking the costs associated with specific items, in which case, if I happen to sell out of that specific item, well, then I've sold out of that item. All of those old costs are going through cost of goods sold. It distorts my cost of goods sold by understating it this period. So 
that is a problem that's introduced with LIFO. Whereas under FIFO, your costs are always a little bit stale. <laughs> so it's consistently wrong. Whereas LIFO is typically right, but occasionally you'll get these big, big problems, which is what causes LIFO liquidation. So specific goods identification or the specific goods approach causes this the most because you're very likely to sell out of any one good as opposed to just selling out of all your inventory. So there are there are ways that we have essentially in accounting have tried to solve this. One of these ways is dollar value LIFO. Under dollar value LIFO, increases and decreases in a pool are measured in terms of total dollar values and not physical quantities of goods. So some advantages of this. One, it takes a broad range of goods in the pool. You can put all of your goods into one big pool because you're measuring all your goods at dollars and not at specific items. So from one standpoint, it doesn't matter if I'm selling the same thing that I sold 50 years ago, it's all one big pool. So as long as the value of my inventory total does not go down, or I say, as long as I don't sell out of the, of all of my inventory broadly, I won't liquidate layers. Whereas if I'm dealing with specific items, I may sell out of these um, like just because of current market trends or whatever, whatever, and say, uh, I don't know, I can't buy toilet paper anymore for, for, for some crazy reason. So I sell out of all my toilet paper and I, end, because of that, I end up liquidating a bunch of life of layers. Well, if I took a pooled approach and pooled all of my inventory, as long as the dollar value doesn't drop below its typical dollar value, I'm not liquidating many layers, if any at all, because at the same time, I'm selling less of some other, some other good, uh, or service. So this dollar value LIFO, it, uh, it includes a broad, broader range of goods in the pool. It permits replacement of goods that are, um, they don't even have to be similar from one standpoint because they're all converted into dollars anyway. So it doesn't matter whether I have inventory of cars this year and next year I sell all of my cars and I buy a bunch of tractors. It doesn't really matter if you're calculating that at dollars, they can both be converted into dollars equally. So we just treat dollars. And it helps protect LIFO layers from erosion. I, you're not gonna erode your LIFO layers unless you just sell down your inventory broadly versus selling out of specific goods or even specific categories of goods. So here's how dollar value LIFO works. Let's assume that Bismarck Company de um, develops the following information. So we have an inventory at the end of each period um, at end of year prices, that's key. It is the end of year prices that are driving um, this method. There is a price index. That price index typically comes out of, say, a consumer price index, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, which gives us our end of year inventory at base year prices. So I'm converting inventory at end of year prices every year back to a base year to basically make them uh, e dollar equivalent of inventory with this notion that, well, um, if I buy I us say whatever, I'm chopping wood today. So if I buy an ax today for $10 um, in inventory, that so $10 of inventory equals one ax today. Now in five years, let's say I buy the same ax for $20. So in five years, $20 of inventory equals one ax. Well, I wanna balance those out. Um, so what I do is I take in five years, I have a price index of, let's say that would be, oh, the price index, it would have gone up by 100%. So it would be 200% or 200 would be my price index. So I would actually reduce it by 50%. That's how that works. If you go up 100%, reduce, to fit, reduce by 50 to bring you back down. So in base year prices, I would have um, $10 worth of inventory, which equals one X. And that is because the $20 of inventory in that year equals $10 of inventory in this year base year prices, it, regardless, it's trying to measure, it's trying to capture one X from a dollar value perspective. So that's why we do that. So we use the dollar value method. Let's use the dollar value method to compute the ending inventory for 2014 through 17, given this example. Okay, so now we're going to calculate the dollar value LIFO. This is our dollar value LIFO worksheet that you'll see here. So we start with our base year, which is 2014 in this case. Inventory at the end of year prices was $200,000. The index is one because this is our base year. That gets an index of one. That index will be going up, which means the prices are actually going up every year, which is typical in our inflationary economy that we have today. So prices are going up, but the base year gets a 
value of one. So inventory at base year prices is $200,000. That's just whatever, 200 uh, um, times one is 200. Um, so our base layer is $200,000. That's our base dollar value layer. Now our index is still one because we're still in our base year, which gives us a dollar value LIFO of $200,000, <clears> um, which is dollar value LIFO total of $200,000. You'll see why we have these other columns here in a second. So we have no reserve our first year. Our dollar value LIFO inventory is $200,000. So now in year two, 2015, we now have $299,000. Our index has gone, index prices have now gone up to um, 115. So 115 means that we don't have $299,000 of inventory at base year prices. We actually only have $260,000 of inventory at base year prices. Now, this is what our total value is, base year prices at the end of 2015. Now, $200,000 of that 260, we actually had last year, right? That was our inventory dollar value last year was 200. So 200 of that was actually from the first year. So 200 of that was, is old inventory. And 60 of it is new inventory that was added, $60,000. Again, these are all base year numbers in this part of the calculation. So we have $260,000 of inventory at base year prices. $200,000 of that is from previous period. 60 of that is from this period. We now convert it back into the value at those periods of time. So the $200,000 is still $200,000, so that's base year inventory. The $60,000 needs to get brought back up to our current value. Remember, $60,000 is the base year value. The current value is actually $69,000. That's just 60 times 115 gives us $69,000, which means our total dollar value LIFO inventory is $269,000. That is our dollar value LIFO inventory. That is the ending inventory amount that we're going to use in our calculations. So our LIFO reserve is going to be $30,000. The $30,000 is the difference <clears throat> between $299,000 and $269,000, the difference between at end of year prices and under the LIFO. Okay, so that means that our journal entry to reduce inventory to LIFO is gonna be for that $30,000. Now, let's move on to our next period. So our next period is 2016. We have $300,000 of inventory at end of year prices. Our new index is 120. Again, this index is coming from a consumer price index. We'll talk about actually, I think, on the next slide. So that's that means at um, base year prices that three hundred thousand dollars of inventory is actually two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of inventory at base year prices. Now, note that's less than what it was last year at base year prices, which means the two hundred thousand dollars of that is going to be from our base year that hasn't changed, and now. 50 of it isn't going to be actually from this year because we had 60 of it last year. So that 50 is actually going to be from last year at 115. So base year is one. Um, the $50,000 is the new period at one at, at or the previous year at 115, which gives us a value of $257,500. That is our total inventory value um, at LIFO. In our dollar value LIFO total, which is $257,500, which means our LIFO reserve, which is the difference between uh, the ending inventory at end of year prices and today is actually $42,500. So that is in 2016. Remember, we didn't actually create any new layer in 2016 because we actually used up a part of the layer from the prior year. Now, if we go on to 2017, in 2017, we have $351,000 of inventory at end of year prices. Our index, new index is 130, which gives us $270,000 of inventory. Doing the same thing, we go back $200,000 is base year. Now we have $50,000 from year two, and we have an additional $20,000 from the current year. So those, we apply the current, the index, index numbers for each one of those which is 100, 115, 130, which gives us a total dollar value of $283,500, which means uh, that our LIFO reserve 
is $67,500. We make our journal entries and we're all done. That is the dollar value LIFO calculation. The key here, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out in dollar value terms, how much inventory do we currently have using LIFO or last in first out, which means we're trying to calculate the dollar value of LIFO of inventory that's carrying forward every year. And we do that without actually having to um, track our, invent our inventory uh, on a last in first out basis. So as I mentioned, critical in this calculation is the selection of a price index. So many companies use general price index. They don't have to track it for their specific items that they're purchasing. They use something broadly like the consumer price index, or they may sp specify a consumer a price index within their discipline, which there's a lot of them that are reported out there uh, specifically for certain goods or uh, even within the consumer price index, it usually breaks it out by major categories. So that is usually the index companies are using. So essentially with just knowing the price index and the end of the value of inventory at end of year prices, you're able to do a full dollar value like a calculation, which greatly simplifies uh, the determination of LIFO inventory. Um, so that is the process. Quick comparison of the LIFO approaches, specific goods LIFO, very difficult to implement, causes all kinds of problems in terms of diving into old LIFO layers or the LIFO liquidation problem. Um, that's why it's typically never used. Dollar value LIFO is used by most companies. There's actually some versions of it. There's like a retail dollar value LIFO method out there that if you go into retail, you'll have to learn that method. Uh, but dollar value LIFO is typically what's used uh, for any company that actually uses uh, a LIFO inventory system. So, so some advantages related to LIFO. So some advantages, it, as I mentioned, it does a better job of matching current costs to current revenues in terms of current cost of inventory to current revenues of inventory. There is some tax benefit and improved cash flow in the sense that you're generally in an increasing price environment. You are paying lower taxes. That translates into cash that you don't have to pay in taxes, which is good. That means you have cash, more cash available in your business. You're basically borrowing money for free from the IRS instead of borrowing it from a bank. <clears throat> and it is a hedge against future earnings because if you have a hard time and your inventory actually does go down, you get to sell off a bunch of really cheap inventory uh, and recognize a little bit of revenues in that sense, uh, which may be viewed as a distortion if you're an investor. But from a management standpoint, that's not a bad deal. Dif disadvantages, it does reduce earnings, which is problematic from a financial reporting and in impress your investors perspective. The inventory value on the balance sheet is understated. Um, if you want to try to argue that inventory assumptions should match some type of flow, generally most things don't flow as a last in uh, first out basis. Although if you had a pile of stuff and we're always taking off the top, that would be last in first out. Uh, and a voluntary liquidation um, or poor buying habits could also skew uh, the financial results. So um, <clears throat> the basis for selecting inventory method. So LIFO is generally preferred if selling prices and revenues are increasing faster than the costs. So that's because you're trying to, your LIFO does a better job of matching the current costs with the current revenues. Also, if a company has a fairly consistent base stock, right, there's not big fluctuations in their inventory values any period of time, you're not going to run into the LIFO liquidation problem very often. Therefore, it makes more sense to maybe have LIFO. Also, if cost and selling prices fluctuate frequently and quickly, which means you might end up with a big distortion between your costs and your selling price because there was a big movement. And you, LIFO captures those movements very quickly because it's matching up. Again, it's doing a great job of matching. LIFO is not appropriate where sales prices tend to lag behind costs. So uh, in which case the lag that's built into the, the FIFO method might make more sense. Also, if specific identification is traditionally used, obviously specific identification is the best matching you can have because it's perfect. <laughs> so if that's typically used, that's what you're just going to stick with and where costs tend to decrease as production increases. So uh, if your costs keep going down because there's say large economies of scale, in, the, in your business, then uh, LIFO might not do a great job. You end up with essentially inventory that's overstated on your uh, financial records and may, may drive you to have to impair that in the future, which you wanna to try to avoid uh, if you can through just your inventory method, your costing methods. There are some tax consequences, as I mentioned, uh, since LIFO generally, uh, because we have generally a rising price environment, LIFO usually provides a lower 
uh, net income, which means you're paying lower taxes, which means you have more money to spend that you're not having to give to the IRS. So there are actually cash consequences to choosing LIFO over FIFO. The last thing, the last thing we're going to deal with is determining the effects of inventory errors on the financial statements. So inventory errors, this is critical. Now we're dealing with this from a inventory standpoint, but this applies in many other areas. You could apply the same logic to accounts receivable and sales. We're going to look at inventory because it's kind of obvious when you look through the inventory calculations or the periodic inventory calculation, how this is being caused. So if we misstate inventory, that misstated inventory affects this year's cost of goods sold and it affects next year's cost of goods sold. And that makes sense when you actually look at the calculation. So if you misstate ending inventory this year, that affects your ending inventory balance this year and it affects your cost of goods sold this year. Remember, because cost of goods sold is calculated using ending inventory. And then next year, when you fix it, assuming you fix it next year, your cost of goods sold will be misstated again next year because you're basically fixing the error. So if ending inventory is misstated, let's say we overstate ending inventory, which means we've put too much costs in inventory than are actually there. If we overstate ending inventory, we are going to mechanically, because we come up with cost of goods sold based on what ending inventory is, we're going to understate our cost of goods sold. So we're essentially taking costs out or expenses out of cost of goods sold and sticking them in inventory or capitalizing them in inventory on the balance sheet instead of costing them through an expense on the on the income statement. So overstating inventory this year causes lower cost of goods sold. Now let's roll forward one more year. Now we're going now that ending inventory from last year becomes beginning inventory this year, which means we are overstating the goods we had available to sell. We then take out ending inventory. Let's say we go out, we count it correctly this year. So we take out the correct amount of ending inventory and that actually was going to overstate next year's cost of goods sold because um, goods available for sale was overstated. We take out the correct amount of ending inventory. It's going to overstate cost of goods sold next year. So this error that we made in counting our inventory this year caused this year's inventory and cost of goods sold to be wrong and it caused next year's and uh, next year's inventory was right, but the cost of goods sold was wrong. So one error caused in, caused <clears throat> one error in counting our inventory caused the final statements to be wrong two consecutive years, where essentially we caused the problem on the balance sheet in the first year, at the balance sheet and the income statement, and in the second year we had to fix it. So we caused another we fixed it through the income statement and caused another problem on the income statement next year. So that is how that causes basically those errors end up causing um, multiple problems over the course of the year. So with that, that kind of wraps up the, uh, this section of inventory costing and how it works out. In the next area, we'll be moving on into kind of the, what I would say the valuation side of inventory or what do we value inventory at uh, when we actually start reporting on the financial statements. But inventory is valued at the lower of cost or net realizable value. Um, so that is, we started with, here's our cost. So that wraps us up uh, for this session. Uh, have a great day and God bless.